Hi, good morning and welcome to this continuing series on cosmology of light musings. And today we're going to focus on the first part of the fourfold emergence in a cosmology of light. And essentially what this will, the ground that we hope to cover basically will start from the idea of the precision of cosmic computational power and here we're viewing cosmos as, in a sense, a never-ending uh, computing mechanism or, or device that takes possibility that exists when light's traveling infinitely fast, which has all possibility in it, and computes that into existence materially. So we look at that in a little more detail and then specifically go into some of the outputs of that computation. And these are pretty significant outputs starting from our cosmic basis of space-time energy and gravity, and then progressively going to more and more material or measurable aspects uh, of that computation. So starting with what we term the electromagnetic spectrum, and then the quantum particles, and then atoms, and then basically cells. And that's where we'll pause for today. And then subsequently, we'll pick it up from a post-human perspective. So once cells have come into being, then in the next section, we'll look at the human being and then other uh, more complex collectivities that are based on, on the human being, and that will further this investigation of what's possible from this fourfold aspect of computation that we're suggesting happens at the cosmic level. So I have with me Margaret, Margaret Faines uh, today, and she's collaborating with me uh, on a book. Um, and she's, she's essentially illustrating a Musings on Light book, which has a number of uh, meditative uh, passages, if you will, about light and its many different aspects. And Margaret's doing some awesome work to just uh, illustrate those different musings uh, graphically. So let me pass it on to Margaret. If she has anything to say, then we can continue. Um, just my name's Margaret Faines and um... I am working on this project with Prevere. Um, what I'd like to say about that is um, that whatever musing we're talking about, uh, at the front end, it seems like formidable to someone who is not a biologist or not a physicist. But um, for myself, and I want to encourage others that, um, there's many ways to take this information in. And um, I'm finding, I'll put it this way, a joyful ways, imaginative ways um, that of course work for what I'm doing. <clears throat> but I think that's something that um, can be part of this discussion is how we can, um, you know, be more open and, and not as fearful of, you know, there's this thing when you're talking about subjects like this. I mean, we're talking about it from a new perspective, truly, but still the, the information has this connotation of, of a scientific paradigm. And so um, as I've been sort of digesting some of that, I just want to say to people, there are so many creative ways that you can learn a little bit about this if you want to know more about these different quadralities that really um, kind of break down that resistance, right, to talking about what seems like scientific material. Thank you, Margaret. I think that uh, you know, that's a really good point and uh, essentially you know, the idea of, you know, if I consider my own background, I'm neither a mathematician nor, nor a <laughs> physicist, but I just had a-, a Could general, have fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a general curiosity. And, and I did spend a lot of hours to 
uh, and and it, it spanned a num you know quite a number of years as well but it's just that I, I got seized by kind of a passion to investigate these things differently and so that's that's kind of the thread i've been following and uh, you know as as i've kind of joked before you know any mathematician or physicist would turn in their grave if they saw you know, what, I, what i was doing and even today, you know, contemporary, uh, I, I'm sure there's there's a lot of there'll be a lot of um, views that you know I really don't know what I'm what I'm speaking about. I'm not a I, I don't have the adequate background and so on to to comment on this. But but I believe differently, and therefore I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that, that's what I'm saying is that I'm starting to believe differently as well. Yeah. Um, and. You know, sometimes what I'll notice is like when you talk about computational power, for instance, mm -hmm. or some of the ideas of how light manifests and there's computational uh, formulas involved. Um, you know, initially there's this what, you know, ha, huh? <laughs> kind of, as I say, there's this uh, kind of reactivity. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what I notice is that there's a way of letting the information come to you where you don't understand it in a certain se sequence, mm -hmm. but you get an impression. And that's, you know, that you're not, it doesn't mean you're not going to understand it logically, rationally, but you can use more than one way to help you get there. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I've been trying to, to work with, you know, some of the ideas of, about computational power, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and quantizing and that kind of, those kind of topics <clears throat> that I don't get them initially like a logical thing, but I, or I couldn't spit out what they are, but I start getting an impression yeah. and then I build on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's so valuable. So I'm going to just pull up that first blog post, which is the precision of cosmic mm -hmm. computational power. And you know, perhaps we, we can discuss that. Um, yeah, right there, <laughs> <laughs> right there. The yeah. first time I looked at that, I was like, oh, I don't know what that means. And, uh, and that's, see, that's what I'm trying to say. It's okay not to yeah. know what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we, go into this very first paragraph that I think has the, the gist and the key to the rest of this and to all the other computational outcomes that we're going to go over in a little more detail. So you know, the very first sentence is saying, in the cosmology of light, it's been proposed that there is a persistent quantum level computation. And if I just step back, the whole idea of cosmology of light is that if we take light as a basis, and of course, we're taking light as a basis, essentially, if I comment on that, because if there is, you know, assume for instance, that you've got different individuals with different points of view, and let's just take uh, for argument's sake that you've got a mystic, and a mystic who perhaps transcends, whose, whose sight transcends normal sight, and mm -hmm. they have experiences, of uh, something that's way vaster than themselves. And one common thread through all mystical experience has been the experience of light. There's also been, Absolutely. for instance, you know, uh, people may experience peace or joy uh, or whatever it may be. But the reason why I focus on light is because light is also the only physical substance that's been measured, uh, you know, as opposed to like joy or, or right. peace. Or, Anything else? It's something that has some scientific basis to it, right? And so I use that as a starting point because you can take light and you can say, okay, we know scientifically that light has a speed of one hundred eighty-six thousand miles per second in vacuum. Yeah. So we have some some proven scientific facts. So that's the reason why I start with light, you know, as opposed to say joy or peace or or anything else, because there's this commonality. And then if we then extrapolate that simple scientific fact that Light, we know scientifically exists at 186,000 miles per second, but then what happens if it can exist at zero speed or if it can exist infinitely fast? Right. 
And so then we get into some thought experiments of, of trying to imagine the reality and the whole idea of cosmology of light is that we can imagine when we consider light at different speeds, these simultaneous realities that, that all um, interweave in a sense to then impact how things show up physically. And therefore there's a persistent kind of arbitration or there's a quantum level computation that connects all these layers of light together to create this reality uh, in a sense. So that first sentence is really getting into that notion there. Uh, one, uh, one thing I was just gonna say is that um, in many ways, when you're talking about the mystic uh, experience and the measurement of light, well, that's always in, those, in the Western paradigm and the scientific paradigm, that's been a sticking point. Mm -hmm. right? Because you can't measure subjective experience. Mm -hmm. So you're able to, in a sense, get around that because the mystic experience and the scientific paradigm share this same concept. Yes. yes. Right. Right. Okay. okay. Yes, that's right. And uh, so the one um, foundation in this whole idea of cosmology of light is that light is multidimensional. So what we see as the physical light, what we can measure, what we know is created, for instance, when electrons jump orbits and emit these photons, that's the basis of light scientifically. Uh, what we're seeing in cosmology of light is that that's the edge of the iceberg, if you will. Mm -hmm. The physical light is just what's visible, but there's a lot more depth to what that light is. And then when we consider light at different speeds, that's where we get to the depth and what light is in its fullness. So essentially, if I, if I just uh, try and um, look at the different parts of the next sentence, which is a long sentence, but this is the key to the whole thing. You know, the, the kernel of this cosmic computational power, I'm just gonna read the sentence once. You know, the kernel of this cosmic computational power is built on a process of triple quantization involving key mathematical transformations. So we got the notion of triple quantization, Mm -hmm. We got the notion of mathematical transformations mm -hmm. by which this unity and light at its native state, so then we're talking about unity of light in a native state, precipitates into vast diversity at light traveling at sea. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so let's kind of delve into that a little bit. So we've brought forward a whole bunch of concepts that, that could make it very confusing for someone when they're reading it the, the first time, you know, because you've got triple quantization, you have mathematical transformation. And you've got the idea of unity and diversity mm -hmm. linked to light traveling differently in, in a state of state as opposed to light traveling at sea. And um, so, you know, very, very quickly, the, the idea of triple quantization, that's a mathematical convenience. Because if we assume that the native state of light is where light travels infinitely fast, then in order to create this reality, the physical reality that we experience here when light travels at sea, you require, uh, at least in the math that I put together, there's, there's three transformations uh, or quantizations that need to occur to make that infinite potentiality into material, into tangible material diversity. Yeah. And, you know, therefore it's a triple quantization and therefore it's, it's and each one is, is related to a precise mathematical transformation, you know, where, where, where um, the ambiguousness of a property that may exist in light when it's traveling infinitely fast becomes more and more materially uh, tangible as light slows down mm -hmm. until when it's traveling at sea, it's, it's the materialization is so precise that it creates this infinite diversity that we experience around us. And, and that's the idea of the mathematical transformations. And then the next part of this, which now we've, we've left behind the idea of mathematics and we're going into the idea of physics, which is a whole different ball game because right. you know, here it's the play between C and H, which are you know, two fundamental constants. C of course being the speed of light and H being Planck's constant. Um, is instrumental in the physics of this transformation. So, you know, the question is, how can something that's subtle and 
that has infinity embedded in it become material and infinitely diverse. And so there has to be some physics involved in that translation. So that's really what we're referring to here. And that physics is the interplay between C and H, between these two known scientific quantities. And I'll, I'll say a little more about that, but it's through this physics that light can be thought to materialize uh, essentially due to the interplay of such physics and the underlying mathematical transformations. So, you know, in that first paragraph, it, it's, it's summarizing the whole idea of cosmic computational precision by, by referring to the ideas of mathematics and physics, except that we're breaking the bounds of what we consider to be in the realm of mathematics and physics. Right. Because usually when we consider physical phenomena, we are precisely focusing only on something that's materialized or is about to materialize in the physical realm. But here we're just saying that a similar physics exists or the process of physics exists even in those antecedent layers. And we're just saying that just as there's an interplay between C and H here when light's traveling at speed C, there's similarly an interplay between an equivalent of C and H in each of those antecedent layers. And therefore we can refer to a, a physics of, of, of a sort. So, so Praveer, when I, um, obviously this isn't the first time that I've seen this, but what helped me when you were saying at this time is kind of, see sort of like seeing a, a board with pieces mm -hmm. and having them move or be transparent and behind them there's something else going on and i think and not having to concretize right now what those things are right but but i think if for me if i can get that there's something in this becoming. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of very interesting possibilities mathematically and, and in physics that could help explain the native light fourfold quadralities coming into mm -hmm. materiality. Anyway, it just sometimes I find a, a little handhold <laughs> mm -hmm. can help just be present with it mm -hmm. and let it let it kind of unfold mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you yeah. yeah so so kind of the takeaway from there is you know light can be thought to materialize due to the interplay of such physics and the underlying mathematical yes. transformations and, and then we get to the whole idea of so we've got this cosmic computational process going on and then what are the outputs of it? So the very first output in a sense is, is what we call space-time energy gravity, which, which in this point of view is, is one whole and it's a light-based quadrality because it, as for the, a cosmology of light, none of these manifesting by themselves would make any sense or nor would it be possible. But it's, it's, it's the combination of all four because they're expressing a fundamental, you know, implicitly they're, they're unified. And so explicitly they need to also um, express themselves in that fourness to, to maintain that, that implicit unification that, that's part of their nature. Um, so the space-time energy gravity is, is an explicit materialization of, of the four properties of light that that uh, we've explored before are, we're calling knowledge, power, presence, and harmony. Right. And, and so that's, that's the idea here. But then the whole idea also is that if in light's native state, we have infinite information that exists implicitly in it when light's traveling infinitely fast, and this information is, in a sense, organized by these four principles, which we call knowledge, presence, power, harmony. 
then as it materializes, it this vast potentiality of fourfoldness materializes in steps. Mm -hmm. So space-time energy gravity is, is kind of a macro container at, at first glimpse within which all this fourfold possibility arises. And then when we look at specifically what, how this fourfoldness expresses more and more of itself, it's first phase that it, that, that it projects forward materially is, is you know, what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. But here I'm proposing that there's, it's actually an electromagnetic wave archetype mass potential spectrum because there's the sense of a quadrality that again uh, needs to be maintained. And, and if we look at what's implied by electromagnetic, we already get the wave archetype mass potential, which, which we can talk about a little more. And then subsequently there's the quark lepton boson, H boson, that's also a quadrality. And then there's the S shell, P shell, D shell, F shell at the atomic level, also a quadrality. And you know the, the really interesting thing is that at least in the at the levels of quantum particles and atoms and cells, scientifically we know that all of these manifest as quadralities. We don't call them quadralities in science, but the fact that there's a four there's four class of categories mm -hmm. of quantum particles, four categories of atoms, four categories of molecular plants and cells means that there is this quadrality that's in action. You know, so, so in the cosmology of light, all we're doing is that we're just express, explicitly stating that it's a quadrality, it's a light-based quadrality that has to occur because it's expressing its implicit nature, which already is a fourfoldness that's unified. Um, anyway, so let me, you know, just just pause there because that's the the part that's the pre-human mm -hmm. part that that we want to just focus on today. And um, so, Margaret, when you were kind of looking through this, you know, what what did was the comments or was there any um, issues that that popped up in your mind? Well, it's it. I guess for me, it's the starting to get a picture or get a, 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 a thought of how starting with the fourfold, there's this computational issue or, or process that's manifesting in all these different layers. And there's a certain, um, when you look at any one of these layers that they're so extraordinary and beautiful. So, um, it, and I, until I was looking, I didn't see how, how many layers of extraordinary formation there really is. I mean, I, most of the time we're just, you know, we're, we're functioning in ordinary <laughs> consciousness and reality. And we don't, we don't see this uh, patterning Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what, what's been striking me is that how this flows from level to level and the connectedness, you know, I'm just starting to read more about the, um, the human thought will sensation part, mm -hmm. but just seeing the continuity, the diversity and continuity, you could say the unity, because that's one of your themes is the unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. Um but it's, it's quite, there is a certain awe, you know, when you, it's, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's like, my goodness, there's this fourfold <laughs> and it's just really, you know, the reality of it, how it is in all levels and then starting to see how it is in, in our own being. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the thing is that it's, it's I, you know, of course it's, it's natural for us to, I think as human beings to to just fragment things because yes you know, we we do it we do it just naturally because there's only so much we can process i mean it's a right it's an automatic thing but if we just look at this first part of this paragraph over here 
you know, what we really have is three, what's considered to be completely independent fields. So when we consider the electromagnetic and the essentially the quark lepton boson, Higgs boson, you know, we can say that that's what physics is really con concerned about. You know, it's, it's, so the whole physics is, is kind of covered in the space-time energy gravity, the electromagnetic spectrum, and then this um, manifestation in that, that we call quantum physics quantum. of the quantum particles. But then if we looked at, at the next layer, you know, it's a base of all chemistry. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have atoms that are either S shell, P shell, D shell, or F shell, but then, you know, there's, there's all the different chemical possibilities that come up from different compounds and the way these atoms combine together. And then if you look at the third layer, there's, we're talking about biology, you know, it's a basis of mm -hmm. biology because, because then you have in a sense, you know, what keeps a cell, a living cell intact and what are the, the pieces of it and uh, how does life function? Uh, how does life adapt? And so, you know, these fields, physics, uh, chemistry and biology have been studied independently or as separate fields, but right. essentially, you know, what, what in a cosmology of light, what, what we're saying is that they're just different manifestations of the same underlying principle that we segregate artificially as physics, chemistry, and biology. And there's philosophical and psychological implications <laughs> yeah. that go along with that, you know, that, that expand that out. And of course, I think uh, many of us have been looking or studying, experiencing how to bring these, what seems disparate mm -hmm. into more of a, uh, a knowledge and wisdom of what is more of, of a unified understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, and then you, what you, where you said you were at right now, which is on the top right. of the emotion sensation. Yes. So then precisely, you know, you're getting into the whole, there, there's a whole different field there, psychology. Right. You know, but, but we're saying it's, it's got the same underlying principles. And then right. you get into organizational culture and, and uh, development and, uh, creation of corporations and economies and just so that's a whole next level of the knowledge power presence harmony culture quadrality and then you get into the whole notion of um, civilization which which is at the next level of complexity with with the knowledge uh, power presence harmony uh, genius that shows up at, at national levels or essentially that's at the seed of of the way different countries, uh, capture their essence or uniqueness. Yes. And then the interplay. So, you know, what we're talking about is, in a sense, the unification of all these different layers by the common fourfold principle that, that cuts through all of them. And that, that uh, the source of which is found in this point of view in light. Uh, and, and again, we, we, we use light because it's, it's common between science and um, spirituality or mysticism. Mm -hmm. um, but, and so that's kind of like the, the quote unquote logic of um, you know, how we're viewing things from a cosmology of light point of view and how everything's completely integrated in light. So, um, so one, one more thing, I think that as we're going through this, um, what keeps kind of going back and forth and maybe there'll be more of an emergence and interplay is, um, I think unity and diversity in the normal way of thinking of it is thought very separately, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we're going through this and we're seeing that unity those fourfold principles in that diversity, in that diversity. So I think there's a, a different way of experiencing it, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and I think that that, that may be a, a way of more deeply understanding this eventually. Mm -hmm. Prepare, I think yeah, yeah. You know, when you said something about the steps of quantizing, um, well, I think there's steps in understanding 
new concepts mm -hmm. because there to me it, you know you've mentioned sometimes about the expansion and contraction of potential and i think that you know as you as you start to take in information those processes are going on um and i'm feeling like that's you know instead of trying to push it or you know make it happen like well i really want to it's like no just let that back and forth go on and then that then a new synthesis could occur mm -hmm. of holding yeah. both yeah 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 yeah, yeah you know, you're right because you know, usually when we think about unity and diversity they're in a sense you know two ends of a spectrum and, mm -hmm. and tend to view unity in a certain way and then diversity in a certain way but you know what we're saying here is that it's one and the same thing it's just yes. it's a different way they're completely symmetrical you know mathematically we would call it symmetrical it's just your point of view of looking at it that makes it look infinitely diverse or makes it look um completely unified as unity you know so it's uh yeah but but like the back and forth and just Kind of letting that percolate so that a different kind of vision comes forward is, I think, a very practical way to step through. I think it's essential for this work yeah. that you're doing for the, um, I think it's an essential process. Um, and like I said, you know, if I can you know, just share that if there's someone listening to this later on, to just, um, the mind is is very relentless and wanting to know what it already knows <laughs> in the way that it knows it. And it brings up, you know, attention, I find that it's like, no, I don't want to go outside that. Um, and to not let that stop the review and assimilation. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. okay not to know and it's okay to be challenged and it's okay to um let this come in and in whatever way it can mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah 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 and uh, i think you know the, the the final point on this particular blog post the idea of the precision you know why mm -hmm. why is it the precision it's it's precision and we've only considered like some levels over here you know and and within these but i was just giving the example that if we looked at the quantum particle quadrality at that level then even within that we see that there's a separate quadrality that creates one of the categories of quantum particles which we call bosons essentially you know and so here was the idea that even if we look at, you know, what what we scientifically call gluons or W and Z bosons, photons and gravitons. Gravitons, of course, is is not proven yet, mm -hmm. but we see again that these fundamental bosons that are known to us and that are hypothesized about, um, they follow again this this fourfoldness. You know, so so there's there's a. Uh, the point being that there's there's a a cosmic precision, but you can't capture all of it. You know, you can only because it's it's so precise and everything is is so layered and and everything is in a sense so deliberate. But we can we we only see parts of it that we've studied, and here you know this blog post is just a summary of some of the things which which we've already covered. You know. In our summary look, it's already we see physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, and just organizational development. Right. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, but then you go into each of those and you get into precisions that that must have been followed in order for all of this uh, stuff that that we see physically manifesting uh, to have manifested in the first place. And so, and and you just in that sentence, you you also bring in cell based. Uh, DNA quadrality. I mean, just that alone is 
talk about precision and manifestation, that, uh, that's a, an entire world of understanding. Yeah, and I, I haven't, uh, so far, I haven't spent much time on the ACTG. You know, I know that, I know that there's four components to, to mm -hmm. DNA, uh, but I haven't been able to map you know, which one maps to, for example, like the knowledge, the presence mm -hmm. of power, the harmony, uh, you know, simply because I, I don't know enough and I haven't, but I'm sure somebody who's researched genetics in a lot of detail, you know, might be able to see the links if they were to see how I came up with the mappings for the other areas, mm -hmm. they might be able to draw the link, you know, so. Well, and, and you know, for just for the lay person, just looking at the way they fit together is so extraordinary right that the, the two that are mapped the two that are mapped making this ladder thing i mean that i talk about precision mm -hmm. it's extraordinary and how that was even discovered that whole story <clears throat> you know with x-ray and it's, it's amazing the precision that's required to mm -hmm. even discover it she was yeah yeah so <clears throat> i don't know oh, so margaret if there's you know, I know we had set, set aside time to go into each of these, but I just want to draw back and just ask you know, if, if you'd like to go into anything specific or should we just kind of summarize, should we just end the recorded session? Well, uh, I, think, I think that you should do a summary um, yeah. just on what, you know, like you've kind of done takeaways, but I think, I would appreciate repeating the the, the uh, takeaways. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so let's go to the space, time, energy, gravity, light based quadrality because that was a the next piece over here. <clears throat> so I'm pulling that up. And here, if I were to um, summarize that, so one way to think about it is that. Um, when we consider light traveling infinitely fast, then we're saying that there is infinite potentiality in there. When the first quantization occurs in this model, that is when, when we have the first quantization or mathematical transformation, then the four properties that we're seeing exist in light. And uh, let me just step back. So why are we saying there are four properties? We're saying because if we consider, you know, imagine a, a large space that that or a large volume, and you have a light source at the center, and if it's traveling infinitely fast, then the the way we come up with those four properties is saying that when light travels in, infinitely fast, it's going to be immediately present everywhere in that large volume, and therefore we have this quality of presence that pops up. If anything appears or disappears in that one fabric of light, then light's gonna have a knowledge of everything that's happening in its, in its space. And therefore you got the property of knowledge popping up. If anything not in the nature of light were to arise, then light would sooner or later overcome it. And therefore you have a property of power that pops up. And since everything is connected in the one nature of light, there's a implicit harmony in it. So we have the fourth property that pops up. So we've got these four things that are ambiguous when we consider, I mean, to our minds, they, they appear as ambiguous properties when we consider light traveling infinitely fast. And then we're saying that with a first quantization that this ambiguousness becomes less ambiguous. And, and therefore um, the, what we are calling approximately knowledge, power, presence, harmony, diversify into quantized or differentiated sets in which we can see more precisely what we mean by knowledge or what we mean by presence or what we mean by power or what we mean by harmony. So that's the first quantization. Now with the second quantization, you've got these four large sets and these four large sets, now we're, we're proposing that there's a further differentiation that takes place where you can have the source of what we're calling the seeds of materialization show up subtly because a subtle seed can be 
created from any number of individual or unique elements from these four large sets of knowledge, presence, power, harmony. And therefore we have the notion of the idea of infinite number of seeds that come into place, which is the basis of space in a cosmology of light. So when we come to the idea of space, time, energy, gravity, what we're saying is that these infinite subtle seeds are the basis of, or they need an arena in which to express themselves and to play. And that arena we can think of as space. So space is in a sense seeded with infinite possibility that exists in when light's traveling infinitely fast. Now, when we think about time, time is that idea where you have this possibility that's latent now in a materialized seed actually maturing to, to express that possibility materially, whatever's contained in it. And so time is this idea of the maturity. And so you've got the idea of time that comes into play. Now, energy is, can be thought of that thing that in that process of maturity, the thing that accompanied the seed takes on a material form, but it's the same energy that it begins to express itself more and more concretely. And so you've got the idea of energy. And then you have the idea of gravity because, because always if we see around us, there's a relationship that exists between any object and any other object. It's not all clumped together in, in, in one space, but, but it shows up differently. And that's the idea of gravity because there's a harmony that, that is essentially created by a relationship of seed with seed or seeds and seeds. Um, and so we've got this quadrality that, that we're expressing as knowledge, presence, power, harmony, or, or we're saying as knowledge, presence, power, harmony through this triple quantization becoming space-time energy gravity which is nothing other than knowledge, presence, power, harmony, and becoming the macro container within which all the other fourfold manifestations are going to materialize gradually. So space, time, energy, gravity is the first of these. And so that's, that's the mystery of, of, of space, time, energy, gravity that uh, this, this uh, blog post really goes into. Is, is that okay, Margaret? I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, Again, it's kind of awesome in that how you link that, you know, the quantization to how the seeds come forward and that how that sets up the quadrality and in this way, it's very helpful. It, it's, it's, um, it does have a feeling <laughs> of expansion, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, when you're listening to it, it's like, well, we're talking about some very large forces here. The forces that come into play into yeah. how our world exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and here, we're talking about the, the macro aspect of space-time energy gravity, but, right. but also, what what I what I propose elsewhere, and when we come to the the biological layer, then the action of genetics requires the micro action of space time energy gravity as well. Because anything you know, when when we when we consider it philosophically, if all possibility is embedded in space as as differentiated seeds, mm -hmm. then any change to those seeds, different outcome. Yeah. Which, which is the basis, which, which, you know, we can think about all these seeds as being the basis of genetics in a sense. Yes. You know, it's, it's like genetic um, type information that, that is already existing there, but it's not separate from time, energy, and gravity. I mean, it's, it's all a cohesive whole. And so when we come to the field of genetics, my, my only point is that space, time, energy, gravity is all required to make even the smallest genetic change. Wow. You know, because, because it's in a sense, the script by which we can understand genetic information and how uh, genetic change might happen. It's, it's it, in this point of view, it's due to the action, the micro action of space time energy gravity, which, which is a fourfold script. So the quadralities are also 
computational? Uh, I mean, in, in the sense that, um, yes, they can be considered like space time energy gravity can be considered to be a, a, a certain computational code okay. that's manipulated to create a new possibility. Wow. Right. So that's, that's something that, that's a takeaway for me. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, we, we'll, we'll come to it. I mean, and I'm sure, you know, as you go through the, the rest of the musings, you know, as, as you- Well, you I remember know. there being, yeah. with the genetics, there was, I think, compu computational input and something yes, for the exactly. output. So I, I do understand that, but somehow seeing these larger forces also as input output. Mm -hmm. um, and from large to small, mm -hmm. there's a there's potential there that I had. It's kind of whatever way where you look, there's infinity. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, the reality. I know that's so <laughs> really. Woo! No matter how you look, no matter yeah. the way you do, it's just yeah. that's that's the amazing thing about it's right. just so amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, if we go to the next. Um, kind of output or outcome in this sequence. So we got space-time energy gravity when we consider it for the macro that creates this container within which the rest of possibilities going to emerge. But then we also know that there is something that we we call the electromagnetic spectrum, which is fundamental to how we frame light. Mm -hmm. Because scientifically, light is uh, supposed to, in a sense, be this these oscillating uh, waves of electricity and, and magnetism that 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 uh, travel together, and that's scientifically how we're defining light. Mm -hmm. And there's infinite number of uh, wavelengths, infinite number of frequencies, so light can have can can have a massive wavelength or it can be really compressed and, and just kind of travel like this. And um, so there is a basis of the energy contained, you know, the higher the frequency, the more energy is right. going to be contained by light um, traveling in that manner with, with a very high frequency. And, and so, but when we, step back and, and really look at, okay, what is the electro, the magnetic aspect really telling us? You know, we, we intuitively get a sense like the, the electro is, is telling us that power aspect mm -hmm. of, of what is uh, coming from the four properties of light in its native state. And the, the magnetic is telling us the harmony aspect. Mm -hmm. But then when we look at the range of different frequencies and different wavelengths, we already get a sense for the vast number of quote unquote archetypes right. that, that exist that, that we know are the basis of all or many, many technologies that we have um, kind of mined or, or used just materially, you know, whether it's our, our cell phones or our TVs yeah. or the radios or, or uh, your travel or whatever it is, but they're all based on, they require um, or they're leveraging certain frequencies of light or, or wavelengths of light. So you already get a sense that this vast range of archetypes is giving you a sense for that quote unquote knowledge aspect, you know, and that it has all these archetypes that are possible. And then there's the fourth aspect, which is mass potential. So you know, that, that, that becomes clearer, for, for instance, when we consider the human body I'm just extrapolating quite a bit forward, but we know, for instance, that certain organs in our body are much more receptive to certain frequencies, frequencies of light. Right. Right. Um, so if you know if there's something that uh, you know we want to um, experience that that would strengthen our heart, you know, maybe it's a green frequency, um, you know, and so on. So there's or or supposedly. You know, when, when we have a violet or a blue frequency, then it's affecting our mind in some ways. But the point being that there's a mass potential. The way mass manifests is linked to also the frequency of light. Mm 
mm -hmm. right? Uh, because the fact that you can have mass um, kind of aggregating as, as a brain or as a heart or as another part of the body, which, which responds entirely differently from to different frequencies of light, means that the okay. idea of um, this mass potential is is a, is is tied into the frequency of light. So you, you see a fourth aspect right there. So so you're seeing again a quadrality. The, the quadrality in what you know I, I would term more fully as this electromagnetic wave archetype mass potential spectrum. So it's not just an electromagnetic spectrum. And so that's the, the third aspect. And then if I were to go back and just, you know, very, very quickly, we still have a lot. Maybe we can just pick it up next time. Or, yeah. uh, you know, we can, we can continue whenever we have the next conversation and just wrap this, this part up because we're almost at the end of the hour. Um, but then, you know, we see similarly. So, so you know, but, but just to step back, you know, what, what we've covered today is, is kind of, you know, as you said, these are like large forces. These are like, they expand uh, our, our, our kind of comprehension or, or I mean, we've, we've got to comprehend differently in order to, to, to grasp mm -hmm. the enormity of these things and right. how they, they create the, the container and the basis for everything else that we're going to look at uh, in a little more detail. But, but coming back to cosmic computational power, it, it's power because it's, it's allowing this stuff to, to manifest in a, in a pretty ordered way and creating all kinds of possibility, so. Well, thank you for um, going into the, this, you know, it's like seeing the large and then seeing the specific output and how that's manifesting. It's, so it kind of anchors things a bit. Um, in the understanding of the fourfold. <clears throat> uh, no matter how many times I'm exposed to these levels um, and the unity part, I just, um, I just think there, there's different kinds of thought forms that come after the exposure. Um, I, I don't think I have to chart that or figure that out, but that you can uh, absorb these levels in a new way. Uh, there's, it's, it's just interesting. We talked about it earlier, but I think the, the interplay between unity and diversity, when you bring in precision, has a different effect on the way you think about it. So thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and I, I, I look forward, I always look forward to what you're going to send me like <laughs> at the end of the week. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you can count on it. <laughs> I continue to be blown away by, by the stuff that I see. So I said, wow, you know, that's, that's amazing what you put together. So, yeah. Well, uh -huh. I think uh, we can say that the fourfold, the initial fourfold is inspirational. Mm -hmm. And it comes through the musings and it comes through the artwork. And I think that's, we can just, you know, enjoy that. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to end the recording. Okay.